Hi, so it's a new year in January 2020, and I wanted to talk to you about a subject that I love, which is tourism. One of the things that strikes me about being in Singapore is how it's the perfect cauldron of activity to describe tourism, as well as development, because it's small, it's diverse, it has it's, you know, an English-speaking population, uh, but it makes a lot of room for a lot of other uh, languages uh, because it, it basically has to. I mean, if you, if you go down the, down to the bus station or if you go down to the train station, you've got languages like you know Mandarin, uh, Tamil, um, and of course English, uh, among a few of them. Um, but the question is, why is tourism important? Let's just sort of do a quick rundown. Tourism is, is important because not, not only for governments, but also for private companies, because it allows you a benign way to test what is in demand and whether or not you are, what products and services are in demand and whether or not they work. When I say whether or not they work, what I mean by that is whether or not they are intuitive enough to use for the beginner. And why is that important? It's important because if, you, if, you, if your products and services are, you know, even if they're very good, um, if they're not intuitive, you're gonna leave out a large uh, population center uh, or large population groups simply because you know, in a globalized world, you have to be able to compete at the level of a beginner in order to get, in order to build enough steam, what we call critical mass of consumers. Otherwise, you end up in a society that basically um, is government run or run by natural resources uh, with the government outsourcing to the private sector but of course, you know, what ends up happening in those situations is, uh, you know, in many cases, unless the technology comes with it, uh, gov governments are, also, are oftentimes forced to take a back seat and deal, deal only with social issues. Um, in Asia, for example, just one quick example before we continue, um, they have all the products, they have the supply chain, um, but even in, in a first world country like Singapore, which is one of the most advanced societies in the world, um, the packaging on products made here and in, you know, whether it's in Taiwan, whether it's in Malaysia, uh, or whether it's in Indonesia, the packaging uh, doesn't work for consumer products. It's, it's, it's inferior. Uh, whether it's floss, you know, it breaks quite easily. Uh, I just bought some almonds, and the taste of the almonds uh, was fantastic. Um, but, you know, the, I had to use scissors to cut uh, the package because it's just not done right. And that's not a problem you see in countries that have an advanced consumer supply chain like the United States. Um, so let's get back to you know, the other issue which is tourism. If you're able to test products, um, it's really important because you get to, at a beginner's level, you also get to do things like make all of your services and products accessible um, to groups that are typically left out of the economy, like senior citizens, um, disabled, um, you know, just the whole thing, the whole gamut. And that's important because if you don't sort of try to create a society that is all inclusive, what ends up happening is you, you have to circle back, increase social spending and social welfare. And then that's typically when you end up in a position where societies start to fragment. Uh, because when you administer those programs, you're setting one group of people, usually a minority, against another group of people um, within that society for government benefits. And that's when a lot of nepotism happens. Uh, that's when you have this system um, that basically creates a kickback scheme, whether it's social or whether it's financial. Um, now, one of the great things is, well, one example is just buses. You know, what, what's the technology? Is it going to be homegrown? Um, if, if I can't take a bus, and over here it's really simple, you just buy a card um, and you, you, know, it's, it's, you can work it on the train system um, or the bus system. And it's, that's quite good, right? Because it's similar to Hong Kong, uh, which not only has a card, but also allows you to spend that money almost anywhere. And that, what that tells you is you have an integrated system, um, at least domestically. Um, and that, none of that is an accident because you have to have the banks on the, on the same page. The reason Hong Kong was, was the most advanced country um, or you know, region uh, was because of its international connections with the UK which is probably still number one in terms of financial um, prowess, which of course means it's also probably number one in terms of you know, money laundering operations and money laundering destinations, uh, or in the top five. So, you know, if, if it's not just buses, if you can't have a tourist 
use a bus system seamlessly to get from point A to point B, um, you're not, the government's going to lose credibility. And that's a problem, um, of course, because governments can easily lose credibility. And in the, in the U.S., that has not been uh, a, 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 an overt issue uh, simply because the private sector is able, and, and low interest rates, are able to fill in the gaps. And so in America, uh, you know, it's, it's been a very easy process uh, simply because of the supply chain, uh, because of the currency, uh, which has allowed the United States to basically steal uh, the world's best talent and also whatever resources they've needed uh, to create whatever, whatever product they need. Um, and that's, of course, important, but it's not something Singapore can do. It's not something Malaysia can do. It's not something, you know, Indonesia can do. And so, you know, everything you look at really comes down to usability and how you avoid a system of social fragmentation. And to me, it's always been about economics because if you look at everything, whether it's this gas station right in front of me, um, every, or whether it's the buildings behind me, every single thing requires some level of globalization and government cooperation. And the, and the thing is, most people don't realize with tourism what a great you know, sort of focus group that people are, not only because of language, um, you, can, you can figure out how to translate things properly, which then allows you to you know, tap into a lot of um, information that you might not, not otherwise have, whether it's online or whether it's physical. And unless that happens, the, you're not gonna get enough momentum to remove the legal barriers uh, to a gl truly globalized society all over the world. So with, with now tourism doesn't always have to be positive. Um, you know, a lot of countries, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, real estate values, uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize they're linked to obviously economic activity. Uh, that's a little bit harder to realize because of the suburbia, um, sort of post-World War II and city planning, where a lot of the economic activity happens outside of city centers. If you go to Europe, you can see right off the bat, that's, you know, Tokyo, that post-World War II system um, you know, it just hasn't been able to be transported or transferred simply because, you know, country, most countries don't have that much land uh, to experiment with. So in the case of tourism, in, you know, in Singapore, what, what you see is Singapore has picked its battles. It has decided to criminalize heavily drugs, but not sex. And, and so why is that important? Because it tells you for a couple of things. Um, it tells you a lot about the history of the country. Um, it tells you about the opium wars, um, but what's surprising about Singapore is that it used to be a port where, you know, not only was it able to become a leader in shipbuilding and ship repair, uh, allowing a globalized economy to function seamlessly all over the world, but it used to be a port where the British were able to transport opium uh, for free. Uh, there might have been some fees. Uh, there were no taxes, but I think there were some fees. Um, and so that's how Singapore came to have all these other services associated with uh, the country. Um, which almost, and, and its success is almost always, you know, tied back to its ability to become a worldwide port um, and successful. And that's where all these buildings come from. You can't, if you can't get your products in here, uh, those buildings don't exist. So what existed before all of this is the drug trade. Um, and so that's not just, you know, opium. Um, you know, of course, with opium, you have criminal elements. And those criminal elements are oftentimes useful uh, because you can pay them to do a lot of things that uh, can disrupt the country. And so the British, of course, use that to, to their advantage um, in many other places, China, of course, being one of them, uh, with Hong Kong's financial center also developing in part because of the drug trade and because Hong Kong was an English-speaking port uh, that allowed you know, the seamless flow of all these different transactions. And of course, when the criminals got too much economic power, that's when the government decided to sort of make things legal. Um, and you can see this in the United States where if you, go, if you go back far enough, you see a lot of advertisements for, uh, you know, bottled drinks that had small amounts of cocoa leaves um, or basically small amounts of uh, trace, co you know, trace amounts of cocaine. Um, so the idea is how do you get to the society uh, with all these you know, nice buildings and almost no homelessness? Um, and again, part of that is to avoid that social fragmentation. The other part is to experiment. So if you go to <clears throat> a place like the Philippines, you know, you might end up discovering that, you know, a lot of the economy, um, a, lot, a lot of the hotel business revolves around the sex trade. And, you know, as opposed to the drug trade, or it might be both. Uh, a lot of people believe they're linked together. But one of the issues is that 
if you if you don't know where the money is coming from, you can't really have an economy that's that's functional because you can't regulate something that where you don't have all the information. And if you try to regulate, you either typically pass poor regulations uh, or ineffective ones, and then that's when you have that backlash uh, because you you've, you've basically left people out. And when you leave people out, the economy that springs up is usually called um, the black market economy, otherwise known as the underground economy. And Hernando de Soto talks about this a lot. He talks about the legitimate underground economy. And that's when your neighbor charges you, you know, a, a below market rate uh, to, cut, to cut your hair. So if you're poor, you know, you don't see, you, know, you might not be able to afford anything in a, in a shopping mall except the food court. And so services are often done informally, otherwise known as the informal economy. And so Hernando de Soto talks about haircuts, he talks about food stalls, very popular in Bangkok, um, not anymore from what I hear. Uh, just like in Singapore, they, they, there used to be a lot of sort of informal hawker centers that because of potential uh, food safety issues were moved into a more formal structure, uh, which the government subsidized and heavily regulates because it is part of Singapore's appeal as a tourist destination. So if you go to the Philippines, you'll see all these fancy hotels um, and then you'll notice, you know, in, in different parts of the city, um, you know, a lot of 60 year old men who probably divorced uh, going into the hotels with beautiful 20 year old women. And, you know, if you look at it strictly from an economic standpoint, the question is how much of that activity is, is boosting the prices of those hotels, which then have taxes and fees that go back to the government that allows them to develop things like these buildings here, uh, the condos and flats and shopping malls. And so what people don't realize is because economic development by, this, by any central government is uneven, if what, you know, illegal activity typically creates a large part of, or informal activity uh, typically creates a large part of an undeveloped or developing society's economy. That's not just the haircut that takes place in a neighbor's home, that's not taxed. Um, like I said, it's also things like drugs and sex. The question is, if a lot of that revenue is coming from things that you consider your voting population considers uh, immoral, you have to figure out what you want to shut down, what you want to let thrive, and how you want to regulate that. But you can't do any of that unless you're able to have a society that, uh, is, that understands the numbers and where the money is coming from. Because if you are, say, the Philippines, you're not really able to, to compete based on the same level as a more developed country. And, but that's okay. That's how all countries become the way they are. The illegal activity uh, creates a demand for things that might not, not otherwise exist. And over time, that hotel, um, you know, when it's, when it's, if it's in a successful policy environment, then allows, instead of, you know, something that's a sketchy business next door, it then allows, you know, a McDonald's or a more established shopping mall. That's actually one of the reasons you see so many shopping malls all over the world. That's been the development model, um, where you have an underdeveloped area uh, that then receives subsidies or real estate interest um, in order to capture that revenue from the informal economy and then upgrade it and then tax it. So a lot of people don't want to discuss this, this sort of progression from illegal activity to the need to hide illegal assets to the development of the banking sector, to the development of having money to loan, to the development of technology that allows even more development to happen, but in a legitimate way, if the policies are correct. Singapore and Hong Kong are the most obvious examples of that. Uh, like I said, Singapore allowed opium to go through its ports. Hong Kong, of course, um, you know, was, was an obvious uh, destination point for drugs as well. Uh, not just because of the opium wars, but it's anything that, that you allow into your country that might not be taxed um, formally. And one of the problems with globalization is that you can easily sort of manipulate these numbers by making something free like a port, then getting all the demand, and then at that point, you know, either confiscating the assets, like, and that's what's happened in, this, in some countries, where because of that social fragmentation, uh, there's been a lot of backlash against minority groups, like in Africa. Uh, in Africa, it, it really just depends on where you go, but in Africa, uh, the Indian population or the Pakistani population, or whoever happens to be visible but looks different, they tend to get, you know, they've historically received some of, you know, had to be, so they've received some of the blame and then of course that, that leads to, you know, expulsion 
depending on how the uh, social environment and political environment develops. So if you end up, so all these things sort of come together, um, but nobody really discusses it in a way that's cohesive. And I think that's what bothers me when I walk down a street like this, is the in inability to see that all these housing flats, all this development, originally originated from illegal activity and, coloni and colonization at first, um, but over time, if it's done properly, can lead to what we see here today. That's not necessarily the ideal standpoint. I don't want a world of shopping malls. Um, I see public transportation right behind me. Um, it's oddly similar to a, a, sub, a sort of train just passed by. Um, and it's oddly similar to a lot of these trams in Chicago and even in you know sort of small ones in Las Vegas, which again goes back to the economic relationship between Singapore and the United States. So as you're doing all these things, you want to figure out what you want to borrow from the former colonizer, what you want to borrow from the current ally. Um, and if you can do all that, you can get that progression that's typically positive. You can't figure out all the numbers if you can't create a society that's honest with, honest with itself. You're going to end up with that social fragmentation, and you're also going to create a society that just isn't worth living in. Um, and, it's, and, and it won't be competitive because a lot of that talent will go elsewhere. Uh, simply because you know your, your development model um, is not going to be able to compete, um, and that's really the question for governments today: is how do you stay relevant? My point is that it's not going to be focusing on social issues; it's going to be focusing on development. And tourism is an easy way to figure out how to make your products and services and quality of life intuitive, thereby reducing social fragmentation, uh, future social fragmentation. Um, and increasing the quality of life to a point where you're able to attract that talent. Um, and that's really the goal. It should be the goal for everyone. And for some reason, it's not uh, when you listen to politicians. And now it's even harder because a lot of that technology, a lot, of, a lot of that development is based on technology, which is based on cooperating with a global or local standard. And that, of course, involves security, a lot of other things that people don't like to talk about because it's really complex. Uh, but now, uh, Singapore really is caught in the middle between a Chinese standard and, a, and an American standard. America has more money invested in this country than it does in all of China. Um, and this is a tiny, tiny country, uh, otherwise known as the little red dot. And this, so the question really is, where Singapore, what Singapore does is, is really sort of um, a primer for what happens all over the world. And so one of the reasons I like coming here is just to see what's happening. And unfortunately, when I came you know, today, I think that it's not progressing as it should. I had a little bit more optim optimism with the Prime Minister's uh, New Year's speech, because for the first time, he was not pragmatic. He's usually quite pragmatic. Singapore's uh, political reputation is to be honest and pragmatic. And for the first time, he was the Prime Minister was not pragmatic. He's got this quote that will become famous one day if Singapore continues to progress. And he said that no Singaporean will be, no one will be left behind no matter what the vicissitudes of life. That is a bold statement, a bold one. And the real question is, are you going to be able to balance that you know, promise or that goal uh, with not only changing you know, demographics, but changing economies, changing economies, and changing political structures? And that's really the question that's going to determine whether or not you know, the whole world continues to progress together or continues to slowly decline and experience very, very uneven growth.